a video. That's how I contacted him. Um, uh, his uh, talk is really good. Um, I basically followed um, the Learning Alexa by Dave after um, uh, his tutorial, and it was uh, like a breeze to read that textbook. So I really uh, recommend Nate's uh, talk. And he has a lot of other uh, lectures on JavaScript and other things. So I let uh, Nate do the talking now. Thanks. Nate. Okay. Yeah. Well. Good morning or good evening, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Uh, hopefully, we can get through this, and uh, I'll be clear for everybody. Um, if if you guys have questions or whatever, I'm I'm open to being interrupted. Just have uh, somebody on the Zoom interrupt me, and, and if something's unclear, we can go back over it. Uh, or if not, we can have questions at the end as well. Um, so with that, we'll just go ahead and jump on into it. Um, so like like they said, my name is Nate Taylor. We're going to talk about uh, getting functional with Elixir today. Um, my path into Elixir started probably about seven or eight years ago. I, I tried to learn functional programming um, for quite a while. Uh, back around 2010 or so, uh, some of the blogs I was reading, some of the people I was following on, on Twitter and other places kept talking about functional programming. And they kept talking about how important it was going to be in the coming years, uh, particularly as CPUs got uh, more cores and we, we didn't really they weren't accelerating the speed as much, they were giving us more cores. And so they kept talking about how, how important functional programming was. And so I thought, okay, well, I better learn functional programming. And what I did, what a lot of people did back then, I found Haskell, and I started reading through um, online books like uh, Learning with Haskell for a Greater Good and all those kinds of things. And, and the same thing kept striking me every single time. I would, I would start this book and I would Okay, I understand the first chapter, I kind of understand the second chapter, by the third chapter I was in over my head, and I just, I just quit. And I repeated this process numerous times until I finally came to the conclusion that, that maybe I'm just not smart enough for functional programming. Uh, they were talking about things like monads and all this other kind of stuff, and, and I was a well-established uh, object-oriented developer at this point. I'd, I'd been in my career about 10 years. I knew C++, I was doing some .NET, at the time, and, and I understood all of that stuff. It made sense to me. I was talking about objects and um, all that good, fun stuff. Uh, but when it came to the functional side, it just it never really made sense, the list comprehensions and all that stuff. And so I, I, I just chalked it up and said, okay, well, I will have to just stay in the object-oriented space. That's where I'm good. That's where I'm smart. I'm not smart enough for functional programming. And so I kind of put it on uh, the shelf for a while, and, and I just ignored it. Um, and then uh, you know, a couple years later, six months later, something like that, I'd read another blog that talked about how Functional programming made it um, easier to write software and change the way you thought about software. And the programs were smaller and more compact. And, and all those things were appealing to me. And I thought, well, let me try it again. You know, and I went through this process again, and I made it a little bit further in the Haskell books, and, and I gave up again. Um, but then, just I guess by dumb luck, I was following a, a, several people um, in the Ruby community, even though I'd never written Ruby. And they started talking about Elixir. And, I didn't really know what it was at the time, but new languages intrigued me, so I started reading up on Elixir. And, and that's when I found out about Elixir, and I found out that Elixir is really functional programming for everyone. And I say that, not really tongue in cheek, I say that to the point that if I, if I can use it to learn functional programming, then, then anyone can. Um, and that's really the design of, of Elixir, and it's one of its strong points, is that it's, it's, a, it's a practical application. And so I kind of like to poke fun a little bit at Haskell. I think Haskell's a great language, but sometimes I feel like Haskell exists so that there's a program language called Haskell, whereas Elixir exists so that applications can get written. Um, and, and that was kind of the, the shift for me in, in terms of getting me on that path. Um, as some of you probably know, it was influenced by Ruby. It came out of the Ruby community. Uh, Jose Balim, who was the creator of Elixir, uh, was a Ruby developer, and he started looking at um, the things that he liked about Ruby and the things that he didn't like about Ruby, and he tried to bring the things that he liked about Ruby into Elixir. Uh, and, and one of the things that when you talk to people that write Ruby, they, they highlight that Ruby is supposed to be a language in which you enjoy writing software. And I can honestly say that that came with Elixir. When, when I get to write uh, Elixir code, it's just a joy. It makes me smile. Um, I was looking at some Elixir code last night that I had worked on um, and, and it just reminded me of like, oh yeah, that was that was really an enjoyable time. Um, which which anytime you can have an enjoyable time writing software, it's going to be easier to, to learn. Um, oh, it's also built on the Erlang VM, which makes it super exciting to me. Uh, which is kind of counterintuitive because Erlang is a thirty-some-year-old language, and in today's world, uh, at least in the circles I run in, 
Uh, nobody's really excited about stuff that's 30 years old. They're excited about the stuff that came out last night. Um, I do a lot of JavaScript stuff now, and so JavaScript's changing on a, on a daily basis, and, and new libraries are being released, and everyone wants to talk about those. But the reason that the 30-year-old Erlang VM is exciting to me is because it's, it's tried and it's true. It's proven, right? Um, the global telecommunications network is built on Erlang. And so when you think about what's a system that needs to be up all the time, needs to handle failures all the time, and, and, and needs to be able to work uh, without delays, without telling, without telling your users to shut down the system, the, the telephone system is it, right? I've never gotten a phone call from my, tele my telephone provider saying, um, hey, we need you to stay off the phone Monday night from, from 11 to midnight because we're gonna roll out a new software update. Unfortunately, I've done that to my users on my websites and my other applications. And so Erlang gives us that ability to you know, have some of these hot releases, to have the stability. And if you think about what's more global and distributed than the global, uh, phone network, well, it's, it's the internet, right? It's, it's the things that we're writing now. And so I think that's really exciting that Elixir gets to take advantage of this, this software that's been in production for 30 years while bringing some new ideas uh, to, to the market. So that's kind of my, right, my real quick introduction of what Elixir is. And, and so I wanted to try and break it down into what is functional programming. So I said it took me seven years to get to this point because I wasn't smart enough. And, and so let's, let's set the stage so that you and me and everybody else are all on the same page about when we say functional programming, what do we mean? Well, the first thing we mean with functional programming is that it's a declarative paradigm. And that's one of those big words. I call them big O notation words. Um, if you have a computer science degree, then you've done a lot of big O notation. I don't have a computer science degree. Uh, I have an electrical engineering degree. And, I, and so big O notation was not something I learned until I was in the industry. Um, but declared, it's a declarative paradigm. And, and what that really means is what versus how. And so if we have this code, this is some JavaScript code, but it's, or I'm sorry, this is some C-sharp code, but it's very common code for anyone that's done some C-style programming, whether it's C-sharp, Java, JavaScript, um, C++. This is something that's very similar to, or familiar to a lot of people. Uh, and, and as we walk through it really quick, we'll see that there's this for loop, and it's gonna start at zero, and it's gonna run through all of the users until it gets to the last one, by, and it's gonna do that by incrementing by one every single time. And then it's gonna say, okay, well, if, let's check this user, and if it's active, let's add them to another list of users called active users. And at the end, somewhere below where this code snippet is, there'd be a return of that active users uh, to give the code um, the, the list of active users. And, and this is the imperative paradigm. Uh, but the declarative paradigm is much smaller. Here we have uh, Elixir syntax enum.filter. We're giving it our users list, and then we're giving a, a anonymous function uh, where we just say, return everything where u dot is active is true. And so with this one line, we're changing it from telling the program, or from telling the compiler rather, how do I go get the data, to just simply telling the compiler, this is the data I want, all right? So back here, we had to tell it, start at zero, go you know, increment by one every single time, check this flag, add this here. But on this code, we just say, hey, I want all the users that have an is active flag that's set to true. Uh, and so this is the beginning of, of, of the what versus how. With functional programming, with the declarative paradigm, we're trying to tell the computer, what do I want? And not so much, how do I get there? Uh, and I, I like to joke around and say that it's kind of like a robot, right? I'm telling my computer, go get me this data, and it just knows how to go do it. Um, as opposed to me telling it, first do this, then do this, then do this. Um, and so that's the, um, oh yeah, so I got ahead of my slides here. Uh, so that's the declarative paradigm. The, the next part of functional programming is that functions are first class citizens. And this is something you hear a lot when you start learning functional programming. Um, and it's, it sounds really cool, but you're not necessarily sure what it means, or I wasn't necessarily sure what it meant. Um, and, and so if we go back to that filter, what we could do is we had this anonymous function, this u is active. Um, we can name that is active, like we see on the screen here. We're just saying is active is now this function. And we can call our same enum filter by passing in that is active. And so now our filter contains two parameters. It contains a variable that's representing a list of users, and it's containing a variable that's representing the active, there is active function. And so we're passing around this function the same as we are passing around a list of users or any other data. And so that's what it means for functions to be first class citizens. Uh, and then the third major component of functional programming is that it needs to be immutable. 
Um, and this one's a little debated in the functional programming community. Some people say absolutely it has to be immutable. Some people say oh, not necessarily. Um, but with Elixir, Elixir uh, has immutability. And again, that's another one of those big O notation words um, that makes us sound a lot smarter than maybe we really are. Um, so immutable data is more of a simple concept once we get behind the, the vocabulary there. So here we have a list of users like we've seen elsewhere. Uh, and we have two. We have the first one shows that uh, it, it's active and the second one says it's false, or it's inactive rather. And then we want to do our enum filter users is active, and we're going to assign that to our active users uh, variable there on the left. After that's done, our users variable still has the two users: is active is true and is active is false. But our active users is a, is now a variable that holds a list that is only having that only has one item in it, and that's the is active is true. And so it didn't change the users uh, variable; it only created a new one. It will not. So functions in Elixir will not change the data that they're operating on. They will instead return a new object from, this is an object oriented, a new data structure uh, that, is, that is not changed. Uh, so it's not going to change the current one. It's only going to produce a new one. And this gives you a lot of advantages. It, uh, it makes it easier for memory management. Um, oddly enough, it seems like it wouldn't, but it allows some performance improvements because it's able to tell that at, at what point in the object tree did the object change or did the did the structure change and and it, it knows if the top of the top node is still the same reference then nothing below that change and so immutability gives us um, some performance improvements it also gives us that assurance that uh, if I pass users around to a bunch of different functions none of them are going to change that data out from underneath me. Uh, I like to say that if if you think about having candy bars and, and I gave you guys all a candy bar, and then I took a bite of my candy bar. Um, immutable candy bars mean that your candy bars don't have the bite taken out of them. But if they were, if they were mutable, if we were all sharing the same candy bar, as soon as I took a bite out of mine, uh, a bite would have disappeared from all of yours. And nobody wants that on a candy bar, right? Like I don't want to be holding a candy bar that suddenly a bite is disappearing out of. And so the, the immutability nature of functional programming gives us some of that security and some of that surety that, that the data we're working with isn't changing unless we're telling it to change. Um, how Elixir handles the filters is a little bit different than how I wanted it, and this kind of stays with the immutability. So what I wanted to do when I came to Elixir was write code like this. I wanted to have users.filter is active. And, and sure enough, if you do um, C Sharp, if you do JavaScript, if you do some of these other languages, you might see some code very similar to this. Um, but that's not how Elixir does it, right? Elixir does it this way, where you call the enum.filter and then you pass in users. And it took me a while to figure out why. And then one day I was listening to a, a podcast, and I think it was Jose uh, talking about it. But um, anyway, one of the core Elixir people was talking about when you do it this way, it, it, it reminds you that you're passing the data into this function. And so it's not that you're operating on this list of users. You're instead operating on an enum.filter where you're supplying all the arguments. And so it's a subtle shift to remind you that the data in Elixir is immutable and it's not going to be changing inside your, your functions. So those are the three pillars and, and I hope that you know it was a little bit quick because um, I want to get to more of the Elixir stuff than necessarily the functional programming stuff. But it's declarative paradigm, it's a function that's first class citizens and it's immutability. Now, as I've already said, um, you know it took me seven years to get to this point or eight years to get to this point. Um, I call those big O notation words. So what I like to consider them as is not declarative, first class, and immutability, but I like to consider it what, not how. Functions have the power, and the data doesn't change. And when I think of it that way, when I started, when I started coming to terms with that, that was around the turning point for me with functional programming. Um, I started to say, okay, now I'm starting to understand why would I, why would I do functional programming at all, and and why would I do it in Elixir or with Elixir rather? So Elixir is going to make functional programming accessible. It's going to make it something that I can understand. And if I can understand it, then I'm 100% sure that you guys in the audience, you folks in the audience can understand it, um, that your friends can understand it, that your coworkers can understand it. Because it, Elixir is there to try and make that enjoyable, make that understandable. Um, so I thought what we'd do is talk about a couple of the, the, the key things that people really gravitate to when they come to Elixir. and, and um, they, they might be uh, almost like gateway drugs, so to speak. They're the things that get people excited and get them into the language, and then they move on into the, the bigger stuff or the, the more detailed stuff, uh, which we'll see a demo out at the, towards the end of the, the talk here. So the first one that, that you know, if you were to ask new Elixir users about, almost everyone 
says they love the pipe operator. Um, and the pipe operator, I think the best way to show how it works would be to start with an example. So here we have this code on the screen. Um, there's, let's see, one, two, three, four, four opening parentheses. Um, there's a lot of commas. It's just kind of a jumbled mess. And if, if you throw this up on the screen like it is now, and you can go, okay, uh, what does this do? It's probably going to take you a little bit of time to, to process through. And do I start left to right, or do I start right to left, or do I start in the middle and work my way out? Um, I'm not exactly sure what's going on. But when we use the pipe operator, uh, what we can end up doing is we can split this up and, and pipe data from one function call into the next. So it's really, all this code is doing is it's reading a file. It's that tweets.txt uh, there in the stream. It's gonna split the file on new lines. That's the, the R curly brace slash in. It's gonna trim all the extra white space, which is the string.strip. And then it's only going to get strings that are tweetable. And you can tell that this goes a little bit older um, because it's got the 140 characters. Uh, so I wrote this before uh, Twitter expanded to 280. But if we take that and use the pipe operator, it looks like this. And so we take our path and we're going to path our pipe, or sorry, we're going to pipe our path into file.read. And, and then we're going to pipe the result of that into string.split. We're going to pipe the result of that into enum.map. And then we're going to pipe the result of that into the fn. Uh, into the enum.filter. Um, and so how this works is the pipe operator will take the result of a function and it will inject it as the first parameter in the next function. Um, and so uh, sometimes that's a, that might be take a minute to get your head around because it would be easier, I think, in our minds, uh, or at least if I was writing the language, I wouldn't have done it this way, but it's probably good that I didn't write the language because it, it makes more sense this way in the long run. It, it, it's easier to think of let me tack this on at the end of the function, uh, but that's not how that's not how it works. So it's going to pipe it in there um, before the first parameter. And so as we look at this, we think, okay, well, if I saw this code, right? If I went to an interview and they were asking me about what some code does, and I saw this on the screen, I could I could have a pretty confident answer that I knew what was going on. Like, oh, okay, it's going to open a file, split it on a new line, clean it up, and then find strings that match a, a criteria. Um, but that's a lot different than this code, right? This would take me a lot longer and I'd be a lot less confident. Um, and so that's the first thing that people really start to enjoy with Elixir that I've found anyway, is that pipe operator. Um, and it's focusing then on the first part, the first pillar of functional programming. It's focusing on the what, not the how. All we want is tweetable strings, right? We're, I don't care how the the, the application gets it to me. I don't care what it means to open a file and read it. I just want you to read the file. I don't care what it means to filter the string. I just want you to filter it, right? And so it's focusing on telling the computer what you want out of the out of the code at the end of the day, and not necessarily how to go about getting it. Also, it shows us that functions have the power because now we can start composing this into a into a bigger function. Um, so we can. Um, get all of this and say, you know, maybe we define a function called get contents where we pass it the path, and now we can pass this around all over the place, or we could, you know, probably a better name, uh, now that I look at the code, would have been like get tweetable streams or something like that to, to be a little bit more expressive. But now we can start composing these functions into other functions and start passing them around, um, giving us a little bit more power over what we do. The other main thing that, that developers really cling to when they come to Elixir is pattern matching. And pattern matching is something that takes a little bit of time to get used to, uh, because at first you think, oh, it's probably just like a, a switch case statement or a case statement. Uh, but it's got a little bit more power than that. Uh, and so the first experience with me and pattern matching was actually the equals sign here. Um, and if you read um, uh, Dave Thomas's book on Elixir, he talks about how the equals is not an assignment operator. Um, it's, it's, actually, it's actually performing matching. Um, and so it's technically wrong in, in Elixir, but a lot of people do it anyway. It's technically wrong to say that, that we're assigning first and last to Nate and Taylor here. Um, but what we are doing is we're saying we've got this tuple here, and a tuple uh, is denoted in Elixir with just those curly braces, um, and, and then it can take any number of parameters uh, separated by commas. Here we have a two element tuple. Uh, you can have a three, four, five. You can actually have an infinite number of elements in your tuple. Um, performance, that, performance wise, that's not going to be smart. You need to switch to something like a map or a list. Um, but it is possible with Elixir. So anyway, we've got a tuple here. And on the right hand side, um, maybe we're passing around a tuple of users named. So mine here is Nate, comma, and Taylor. So maybe the first, the first value is the first name, the second value is the, the last name. 
And we do a match here. And so after the result of the first line, um, where we have that first comma last equals Nate comma Taylor, at the end of that, first is now going to equal Nate, and last is going to equal Taylor. Um, if you if you kept up with excuse me, if you kept up with the um, JavaScript community, they started doing uh, destructuring with ES 2015, and that's really what this is. We're destructuring my Nate Taylor tuple into two variables, uh, first and last. And that's kind of cool, like we can get some use out of that. We can probably imagine some cases in which we could destructure stuff and it would be better for us. Um, but Elixir's pattern matching goes beyond that. So if we take this code, and again we have on the right side Nate and Taylor. Um, on the left hand side though we have first and then we have the same string, Taylor. What this is going to do is it's only going to match uh, data in which the second parameter on the right hand side is Taylor. Uh, and so then it's going to still assign Nate to the first parameter. Um, and so we can now start saying, okay, well, I want to deal only with the tailors, and so I would use the, the pattern matching here. Similarly, excuse me, similarly, if we had the same thing on the left, first comma Taylor, but on the right we had Nate comma Diaz, well, now we're going to get an error. This is the error that you would see in your Elixir code or in your IE, in your, in, uh, in your terminal. It would tell you that there's no match on the right-hand side because Taylor doesn't equal Diaz, and so there's no way for it to perform that match. Uh, and so already we're starting to get into some of this pattern matching where now the data on the left actually needs to match the data on the right. And so that's a real high level of pattern matching. Um, and, and like I said, we can probably imagine some use cases where that would be useful. Uh, but let's, let's look at some of those. So the first thing we can do is we can pattern match return values. Um, and so if we go back to this file.read where we pass a file name in, two things can happen when you open a file on your computer, right? It either opens, which is great, or it doesn't. Maybe the file doesn't exist. Maybe it's locked by another user. Maybe it is corrupted. All sorts of errors could happen that would keep it from opening the file. Well, with this code, we have a case statement here where we're telling it to read the file and then do one of two things. So the first line, it's going to match um, on OK with a file. And the second line is going to match with an error and a reason. And so again, we see the tuples here. Uh, on the left, we have a tuple that's OK in the file. And you'll notice on that, the first element of those tuples, there's a colon and then this, the name. So colon OK and colon error. These are atoms in Elixir. Um, and if you've done Ruby, they're, they're similar to the uh, symbols in Ruby. But they're just constants. And the value of the, the constant colon OK is the string OK. And the value of the, uh, of the atom error is the string error. And you can define your own atoms. Uh, but this provides a way for um, Elixir to do some uh, error handling. So file.read is going to return one of two structures. It's either going to say everything was OK, in which case the first line is going to get hit. And what it's going to do is it's just going to spit out the contents of the file to the terminal. Uh, that's what IO puts will do. Or it's going to say, no, I wasn't able to um, open that file. It's locked or it's corrupted or whatever. It doesn't exist. And so it's going to return a tuple with the first value of error and then give you a reason. And so you're, excuse me, you're able to spit out that reason to the terminal or to the, the window in some way. And so this is a way that you can pattern match on the return values. Um, in, in a non-pattern matching language, um, there would be a lot of, there would be some ifs and else's in here, right? There would be like if uh, the uh, first parameter is an error, then spit out the answer, otherwise, you know, spit out the, the reason. Otherwise, you know, it's about the file. Uh, again, I go. I keep going back to JavaScript um, because I think it's kind of ubiquitous, uh, and it's because I what I've been doing a lot of uh, recently. But oftentimes in JavaScript, you'll see those callbacks where error is the first parameter, and we don't have pattern matching like this, so we have to check. Like, if the error exists, go do this thing. Otherwise, go do this thing. Um, but with Elixir, we don't have to do that. We can just say, I'm going to put these two lines in. The uh, the language itself will know which line to call based on how it matches those patterns. But you can also pattern match structs. So you don't just have to pattern match um, return value or function return values. You can pattern match structs. And so here's one that um, I call special event. It's kind of a, you know, a little bit of a, a dummy thing. Um, but you pass in a date. And in Elixir, uh, Elixir uses um, a tuple for a date. It actually uses a tuple of tuples. Um, so the first tuple. In, the, in a date time is going to be the date, and the second tuple is going to be the time, and then the date tuple is going to be uh, month, day, year, 
uh, for the for the, the elements of the tuple. And so what I want to do is I want to give this function a date, and I want it to return me an atom that tells me different things. Um, and so the first one there you can see is October 31st of 1517. Um, that would be the, the day that uh, the Protestant Reformation. But any other time that is October 31st, apart from the 1517, is just Halloween. And so what we want to do is we want to differentiate. We want to say, well, if it's 1517, something big kind of happened then over in, in Germany. Um, but all the rest of the time, nothing big has happened on October 31st. It's just Halloween. And so what happens then is you can see both of them have 10, both of them have 31. But then the third value is that underscore. And in Elixir pattern matching, underscore means, yes, there's a value there. No, I don't care what it is. So it's kind of a wild card. It's kind of like an asterisk or, or just a, you know, whatever matches here is great. Um, the next one you can see would be 10, uh, October 12th of every year is my birthday. Um, or we can say something like uh, the first of every year, so 1-1 one, one would be New Year's. Uh, or we can start getting creative, but we can start mixing in our underscores. And so on the uh, fifth line, excuse me, the fifth line there, we have an underscore one underscore. And so that what that's saying is every month and every year, the first day we're going to return first of the month. Um, and then the third or the sixth one there, we've got underscore underscore two thousand. We could say, oh, that was any time there was we were dealing with Y two K. And we get all the way down to the bottom, and we have this plain underscore. It's not a it's not our tuple anymore. Right? It's just an underscore. And so what it does is Elixir starts at the first line, that 10, 31, 15, 17, and it tries to match each and every single one of these. Um, and if we get to the Y2K one, we haven't matched anything, then we need to have this kind of catch-all, this underscore, to show that it's just a boring, everyday, you know, nothing special going on. If we don't have that, it's going to return that error, kind of like when we were trying to match Taylor to DS, because there's not going to be a match. But this allows you some flexibility. It allows you to, to have some power over your matching and provide some wild cards, uh, which case statements normally wouldn't do. Um, if you were to take an imperative language like C or C++ and try to do a case statement there with some wild cards, it's, it's, I'm not even sure you can do it. And if you can, it's going to be really ugly um, and really difficult to understand, probably hard to maintain. But with Elixir, it's, it's much more powerful and it's much more straightforward about what's going on. Um, but we can also, so so far all we've done is shown pattern matching in like switch case statements, right? Um, but we can also pattern match function parameters. And this starts to get some power, more power into Elixir. Um, so here we have this function, uh, and it's just called is dynamic. And so we're checking various different programming languages. And we want to know, is this programming language dynamic? And so the first one, we are going to have an atom of C. And C is, a, is not a dynamic language uh, by any stretch of the imagination. So we're going to return the false atom. Uh, and then we check, is Elixir dynamic? And, and we say, yes, Elixir is a dynamic programming language. So we'll return the true app. And then we have a third function there, is dynamic, and it's underscore other. And we're going to return an unknown. So our program isn't very smart. It only knows two languages. It knows C and Elixir. And it knows which one's dynamic and which one's not. But the third line there, uh, the underscore tells us we don't care what this parameter is. We're going to match on everything that's not already matched. Um, but we can still name it. So we could have, I could have just left it is dynamic underscore. Uh, but you can also give it a variable name and just pre, uh, prefix the variable name with an underscore so that you can kind of communicate to the people reading your code. And so that's what I did here is to say, OK, any other programming language, we're going to say unknown. So we'll walk through how does this work. So let's take JavaScript. Uh, if we pass in a JavaScript atom to our is dynamic function, what it's going to do is the first time it's going to say is dynamic. Do I match? Does JavaScript match Elixir? It says no. Uh, those don't match. So it's going to go on. It's going to gray that one out and say I can't process Elixir can't process this. Then it's going to say um, does JavaScript match C? So say no. Those two don't equal. So it's going to cross that one off and say okay, the C function can't process this. And finally, it's going to come to is dynamic other, and it's going to say well I, I'm a catch-all, so I will. I will process this, and I will tell you that it's unknown. Um, or we could go with uh, is dynamic C. And again, we'll start with the Elixir. And the Elixir says, well, I, Elixir and C don't match, so I can't process you. Um, but then it goes to is dynamic C, and it says, oh, yeah, I, I, I match that. C and C are the same. So I will, I will process that, and I'll return um, false, because it is, a, it is not a dynamic language. But the point here is that it stops after that second function call. It never, it never goes to the is dynamic other. Um, and so it returns false as opposed to unknown. 
And then, of course, if we were to go through um, and run Elixir, it would, it would hit the first one, it would match, it would return true, and then it would stop. So those are some of the big concepts of Elixir with the, the what, not how, and the, the powers of functions. I want to do a demo for the power of immutability. So I'm going to break out of this uh, PowerPoint here for a second. Um, let me pull up my activity monitor. Okay. So what I've done, uh, well, I'll do. I'll tell you what. I'll do the demo first, and we'll kind of walk through what's happening. Um, so if I do get functional flow benchmark, get functional flow. Oh, hold on. Uh, stream count. So what? What we're going to do here is this is going to go through and it's going to um, process a, a text file. And it's going to read this in and it's going to count all the words and it's going to sum up the, all the words and it's going to tell us um, how many of each word were, how many, how many times each word was used. And by using this benchmark function that I wrote, it's going to just simply return the time. So it took us nine seconds to, um, to read this text file. And, and what I did for the text file was I took the King James Bible in English and I copied it twice so that there's multiple copies in this um, text file because that's a pretty significant size of text um, and it's public domain so I didn't have to like go generate anything. Um, uh, and so I was able to create this text file and have it process it. And so if you think about, you know, I mean, it's, we're not talking gigs of data, we're talking, you know, Ks of data, hundreds, maybe even 100K of data at that. And it took nine seconds and that's, I mean, that's not bad, I guess. That's but it's not great. So if we change this though from stream count to flow count, which is a function that we'll look at here in a second, and we run the same thing, um, what we'll see is it took 2.1 seconds, 2.2 seconds. So like about a fourth of the time, right? So what I want you to do is watch over here, watch the CPU. This is, the, this is an eight core machine that I'm running on. And so right now you can kind of see four of the cores are kind of active. Um, this one is probably the most active, and it's about a third of the way, maybe a fourth of the way. Um, and none of the other four are active. So if I do stream count again, and we're going to let this run for the nine seconds, okay. Now, these four cores are, you know, maybe this one gets almost a half. Um, these others are kind of doing stuff, but, but it might not be related to stream count, right? This could just be like my Zoom meeting over here is this core. And again, it took 11 seconds this time. Um, so if I go and do the flow count again, and we watch the, the CPUs, well, now they all instantly peg out to full, and then they just drop down. And so what's happening here is because of the immutability of the data, and we'll look at how this works in a second, because of the immutability of the data, I was able to use all eight cores in my processor uh, and, and take this, this calculation that's going from nine or 11 seconds down to something that's going in two seconds. That's pretty exciting because the code I wrote for this isn't really any different than the code I wrote for a stream count Excuse me, it uses a different namespace, and that's about it. Um, but because of how Elixir is architected behind the system, it, uh, behind the scenes rather, uh, it, it provides us this way of allowing us to, to distribute this data across our machine, or across our cores. So we'll jump back into the um, presentation and
Yeah, yeah just, just one, a minute ago, um, when we were talking about like... After yeah. the demo, just see, I think the demo got over. Yeah, 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 uh, uh, after you, like... Uh, finish the, the demo. Yeah. After you finish the demo. Yeah, after you finish the demo, after you, yeah. You, you film that. Yeah. Yeah, you just give it a try. Hey. All right, you guys hear me there now? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Going good so far, uh, Nick. Thanks. Yeah, not a problem. So let's get back into the that. All right. Yeah. So let's get back into the that. Oh no. I think it again died out. Call him back, call him back, call him back. Uh, what the hell is that? Okay, should I try connecting it? I'm not sure if it's, if it's the laptop. It's done again. Okay, I might be in here twice now. I am. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. I'm not sure how that happened. Yeah, that's okay. We'll yeah, please carry on. I think we can hear you now. Oh, well, hold on. Uh, so, okay, there we go. Finally, the other guy died. Okay, so we'll share that. And I need... There we go. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay. So you guys saw the demo, right? We saw the, the CPU spiking? Yep. Okay. So what we'll do then is we'll get, we're going to jump back into the presentation. we we'll walk through what was going on in the demo. Um, so... Give functional flow was the module that I wrote for this demo, and and you can tell it's the module name because it was an uppercase. And then benchmark and stream count were some functions I wrote for the demo, and, and you can tell in part that they were functions because they're lowercase. Um, and so the the that kind of makes sense if you try to uppercase a function name or lowercase a module name. Elixir will complain and give you a warning. Uh, that's probably not all that earth shattering. You've, you've seen that before. Uh, the ampersand is used in other programming languages to say pass this value by reference. Um, it's used in Elixir to pass around functions. Um, so specifically functions that, that are uh, written uh, by custom functions that I wrote or that you write. And then the slash zero at the end here, that's what they call parity. Um, and parity is another one of those big uh, functional programming words or big, uh, big O notation words. Uh, parity is just the number of parameters that a function takes. And so stream count, theoretically, could have a, a version that takes zero parameters, a version that takes one, that takes two, that takes any number of parameters. Uh, in reality, in this code, there's only one version of stream count that takes zero parameters. But Elixir doesn't know that. So we have to tell it which version are we wanting to run. So we're telling it to, to call the, the version that takes zero parameters. Um, so let's talk about what's actually happening in this code, or in, this, um, in the demo here. So if we look at an Elixir process, it might look something like this. The, the purple block there at the top would represent some code that we have. And the, the bottom you know, cylinder would represent some data. Now, I did use the database symbol. It doesn't have to be a database. Um, as we saw in the demo, it was a text file. Um, it could be a database, it doesn't have to be. But this dotted line around these two represents an Elixir process. There's some code and it's operating on some data. And Elixir has a lot of these processes. In fact, they're Erlang processes. Um, and we said early on that Erlang was the foundation of Elixir. Erlang has processes, um, uh, and they're not they're not operating system processes. Um, and so um, that's that's one source of confusion. A lot of times, people think, "Oh my gosh, I have all these Elixir processes. That's going to really slow down my computer." It's not. the The default size of an Elixir process is something like one k, or actually maybe a little bit less. Um, it's not an operating system process at all. It's, a, it's its own process inside the VM. So we have this Elixir process, and what we can't do, though, is we can't share this data. So we can't have one source of data and have these three processes talking to this one source of data. Instead, what we would have to do is we'd have to have each process having its own data. And so you can see here with the arrows that the first process can talk to the second, the second can talk to the third, and the first can talk to the third, and the third can talk to the first and second, Basically, they can all talk to each other. And they do this 
not by manipulating each other's data, but by passing messages. And so, in a lot of ways, um, this is actually somewhat similar. You know, I've heard some people uh, in the Elixir community uh, kind of tongue in cheek say that Elixir is the most object oriented programming language they've ever worked with. And they say it kind of tongue in cheek, but there's some truth there because what it's doing is it's passing messages between these processes. And that kind of goes back to what the original intention of object oriented programming was. If you look at things like Smalltalk, it was to pass messages between objects. Um, hey, our meeting starting. Um, <laughs> All right, uh, so it was to pass messages between these processes. And um, that's exactly what Elixir is doing. And this is how it maintains its immutability. So process one knows that the data that it has is not going to change unless it changes it, right? It, it, process two can't come in and change its data out from underneath it. Neither can process three. The only person that can interact with process one's data is process one. And so what that ends up letting us do then is it allows us to, to split these processes up and send them to different uh, computing units, right? So in the case of the demo, we can send these different processes to different CPU cores. In the case of Erlang, we can send those different processes to different nodes wherever they may be in the world. And the same thing with Elixir. We can, we can have a distributed, a massively distributed network of Elixir processes um, running. And, and so one of the things, um, if, you, if you read some about the history of Elixir, is one of the reasons Erlang was picked is because all of us today have distributed computers on, that we use on a daily basis. But they're distributed on a single chip, right? So it's, oftentimes we think of a, a massively distributed, like a, a DNS a network or something like that, where it's distributed geographically. And, and that's definitely a possibility. But we also have one that's distributed locally. It just happens to be on different cores on our CPU. And so there's really no difference whether we're going to hand off some code to go run. Uh, you know, I'm going to send some code to you guys to run in Singapore. That's, that's distributed. Or I'm going to send some code from core one to core two of my CPU to run. There's really no difference there, um, maybe apart from a little bit of latency across the network uh, as we send it further and further away. So how does this work? Well. What I, I said I took the, the King James, the English King James Bible, and wanted to find the word count. And so the first seven uh, words, or the first six words, rather, of the, of the, of the text there is, in the beginning, God created the. Um, and I, I picked it, at least the first six, so we can kind of see what's going on here. So I want to preface this by saying, this is not exactly how um, flow works in Elixir, but this will give us the idea. So, it might start and break this up and give us a process that has process one has the word in, process two has the word the, process three has the word beginning, process four has the word God, process five has the word created, and process six has the word the. Um, and then what it's going to do is it's going to um, take those words and it's going to try and group them. So process one says, okay, I'll handle every instance of the word the, or I'm sorry, every instance of the word in. Process two says, I'll handle every instance of the word the. And so it's going to take process two and process six and combine them into this one, uh, you know, lighter purple box there at the bottom. And then process three is going to say, I'll handle beginnings, and four handles God, and five handles created. And so what it's now done is it has now accumulated all of the instances of those words on, in that process. It hasn't done anything else with it. It doesn't know how many there are. It just says, hey, if you have, a, if you have the word the, send it to me. Or if you have the word in, send it to me. Um, and so it's going to start collecting those. It's, it's basically, it's kind of like building up a list of all of these. Well, then it needs to go through and sum all of those up. And so process one goes through and checks the length of its list and says, oh, I've got, I've got one. Um, process two says, I've got two. Uh, three, four, and five all say they've got one. Now, again, yeah, I said this isn't exactly how it works because a process could have multiple words. It could have, process one conceivably could have in, the, and beginning um, because there are thousands of words in this text, or maybe even tens of thousands of words in the text, and, and it didn't spin up tens of thousands of processes. Um, but it's kind of a good um, theoretical way to think about it, to try and wrap your mind around it. And so what it ends up doing then is it can send in to, let's say, CPU core one, and it can send the to CPU core two on all the way through. And what it knows is that when, when this, the process that's counting the word the, and it's going to go through and count how many times does this word exist, it knows that nobody else has the word the. And it knows that nobody else is going to change its list. 
And so they can just work as fast as, as I was going to say as fast as humanly possible, but as fast as computerly possible. They can just fly as, as fast as it wants and count all of that stuff because it doesn't have to worry about any of the other processes because none of them are going to change its data. And this is where the immutability really starts to come in. Because we know the data is not going to change, now we can start farming it out. And you saw in the demo that what that meant was all eight of the CPUs just instantly spike. Now, um, you're probably wondering, uh, you don't have to, you can, you can set limits on that, you can control you know, uh, how much of the CPU it takes, how many of the cores, all that kind of stuff. But for the demo, I thought it looked really cool just to show all eight of the cores pegged out. Um, in reality, you probably wouldn't want that, especially on a production server, uh, you wouldn't want something taking all the cores, um, even for a couple seconds, because uh, you know who knows what else might need to happen during that time. Uh, but that's that's how this flow works, and and flow is something that I believe is now in Elixir. If not, it's still in, it might still be in the experimental um, namespace. Uh, but it was something that was released or announced in the 20, um, 2016 Elixir conference in in the keynote. There, they walked through this, um, and it's it's a way that um, it, I didn't write really any different code. I, I wrote some code that opened a file and split the words on white space, kind of like we did with the, the, the tweet example early on. Um, but I did it with the stream instead of trying to load all that into memory. Flow does something similar, but all I had to do was change the namespace from stream to flow, and the code just, just worked. So uh, it actually, Elixir um, handles uh, kind of a, um, a uh, what am I thinking of? Uh, I, the words escape me right now, but basically it queues up a bunch of work and it hands it off to a child process that then like starts aggregating it. Um, and so that's something that's either native in Elixir or if it's not yet native, it's still in the experimental stage and it's getting very close to being native in Elixir. So all of that's kind of a, you know, hopefully gets you a little bit more excited about Elixir and, and gets you thinking about some of the things that you can, you can do with Elixir. Um, I like to wrap things up by talking about, okay, well, what can I do to get started? You know, I, I talked about it taking me seven years to, to get into functional programming. You guys, by the fact that you're in this user group tonight, are already further ahead than me. Um, but I don't want anyone to have to spend seven years to, to learn this because I think, it's, I think it's powerful and I think it, it's helpful. So how do I get started? Well, um, the first thing is install Elixir. Um, won't talk too much about this. I'm going to assume that you guys have. The, the one cool thing that I see here, um, so this is an old screenshot because I think it's one, yeah, it's telling us, hey, Elixir 1.4 is released. Um, and we're up to 1.6 now. But you have your normal OS X and Unix and Windows ones, which are, you know, not surprising. It's supported on every language or on every operating system. You can get Docker images, um, which is cool if you want to play with it and you don't want to necessarily install it. You can just, you know, use a Docker image. But the thing that's really cool to me is that 1.4. That's the Raspberry Pi. So there's a nerd, uh, project called Elixir Nerds. Um, which does embedded Elixir. And the reason that that's exciting and interesting and cool to me, even though I haven't actually done anything with it, is when you start talking about distributing, about how Elixir can be distributed easily, and easily be a distributed computer, and then you start talking about Raspberry Pis, well now you have cheap devices that will run Elixir and you can start having, like, you could create a botnet in your house, right? You could create Skynet uh, from Terminator in your house with a bunch of Raspberry Pis. And they can all be talking to each other and sharing Elixir code. And to me, that's really kind of cool because um, I think a lot of us, I don't know what your guys' age are, so I'm, I'm 40, so when I was growing up as a kid, that was the kind of stuff I wanted to get into, right? Having all these little robots and all this kind of stuff um, running wild. And, and with Elixir and Raspberry Pi and the Nerf Project, you can do that. Um, do a little bit of self-promotion. You guys already heard, we have, I have a getting started with Elixir course on Pluralsight. One of the things that I do when I learn software and, and, and whether it's Elixir or anything else, is I have to have like something tangible. I have to have something that I actually do with it. I can't just go learn the syntax. That doesn't work for me. So what getting started with Elixir does, it walks through the syntax for sure, and it, it gets way deeper than this presentation will. It talks about data types and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but at the end, we create an application um, that processes some data. Um, I, I, this one will tweet out stream source, uh, and that's where I pulled that code from. Um, and so it'll walk you through learning Elixir to the point that you can then write an application. Um, once you do that one, or if you're already comfortable with Elixir, I have a second course on Pluralsight as well called Getting Started with Phoenix. It does something similar. Um, it takes um, an application, and it's kind of a Yelp-style uh, review application, and it creates a web application for that. Um, it is in Phoenix 1.2, however, um, 
it was well known that Phoenix 1.3 was going to change how they structured the projects. They were going to create umbrella projects. They were going to um, separate the logic from of Phoenix out of the Phoenix portion of the application into an Elixir application. All of that stuff was well known before 1.3 came out. So the, even though the course uses the 1.2 library, it uses the 1.3 form because um, there was a lot of concern in the Elixir community uh, that, that people were just writing Phoenix applications without really extracting it out into Elixir. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was at ElixirConf in uh, 2016, I can't tell you the number of times I heard Phoenix is not your application. Um, and that, that kind of comes from the Ruby world where you know there's just one big giant uh, Ruby monolith for projects. Um, and what the Phoenix guy or what the Elixir guys wanted was to say, okay, no, there's, there's this core Elixir component and then the Phoenix portion is just how you deliver it to the web. And so the course walks through all of that. Again, you, you learn what all the ins and outs of Phoenix and you build an application. So that's the way it's self-promotion. We'll get that out of the way. How I learned Elixir, uh, in large part, was from Exorcism.io. And so Exorcism.io is a website um, that has, I think last I saw, 50 some different languages on it. Uh, it's got the standard ones like Java and C++ and .NET and all those you know, good but kind of boring ones. Um, and then it's got things like Elixir and Rust and um, Go, some of the other, you know, maybe newer, trendier ones. And, excuse me, what, what Exorcism IO is, is it'll actually give you exercises, small, bite-sized exercises, and it, when it gives them to you, it's kind of like Git. So you'll do a pull, you'll say pull the next exercise, or fetch, I think, with Exorcism. But anyway, you're saying give me the next exercise. And it's gonna deliver three things to you three files. It's going to deliver a, a text file that tells you the goal of the project. It's going to give you the code file in which you'll write your code. And then it's going to give you a test file in which they've already defined tests. And I think most of the time the tests are commented out um, because if all the tests are failing, that's a little overwhelming. And so what you'll do is you'll uncomment one test at a time and you'll write the code to make that test pass. And then once all of your tests pass, you know that you've completed the exercise and you can push it back up. And once you push it back up, you actually get, um, it's actually, like I said, it's kind of like Git. I think it's built with that in mind um, because you can then start reviewing other people's, um, uh, other people's work. And so uh, something like your guys' user group, this might be a really cool way to, to check each other and share, share how you did things because you can, you can work together. And you, don't, you don't have to work, you know, okay, this week everyone do the number one exercise. You can work however fast or however slow you want it, but, but the code's always there to, to go check. And so I like to tell the story that, so the first one you do is Hello World. Um, and the first one you do in, I think, every language is Hello World. Um, and this one was just basically a, a string interpolation or string manipulation. And I pushed mine up, and I was pretty happy. I got it working, and I started reading other people's uh, code just to kind of see how they did it. And I started seeing this uh, weird um, hash sign within everyone's code. And I started looking, I was like, oh, that's how they do string interpolation in Elixir. But I didn't, I didn't know that before I did the exercise. I just saw everyone else doing it. I went and researched it. Oh yeah, that's string interpolation. So if you go look at my exorcism IO for Hello World, you'll see it has string interpolation because I didn't want to be the only person on exorcism IO that didn't use string interpolation. So I made some changes and I pushed it back up. Um, but, but these were really small, well-contained, um, exercises that, that get you into the thinking of Elixir. My favorite one, and I don't see it on, on this list, but my favorite one was um, you basically wrote your own list module. So you, you wrote your own map, you wrote your own reduce, you wrote your own reverse, um, and maybe some of the others, maybe like a count and a filter, I don't remember. But it was fun, not that I would ever use that code, I mean, why not just use Elixir's built-in one, but it helped me understand things like how Elixir handles recursion and how it does a lot of this other kind of stuff. Uh, and so it was a very fun um, thing, and it was it was done in such a way that you know I might sit down on a on a Saturday and try to do one, and then I look up and it's been a couple hours and I've done four just because it's it's fun. Um, and so that's something that I would recommend you know trying out and checking out um, and, and just seeing if that helps you with uh, different exorcism stuff as well or uh, Elixir stuff. So finally, I want to wrap up. How, how do we demystify functional programming? Well, remember, it's what, not how. So we're going to tell Elixir, what do we want? I want a list of strings that are tweetable. Or I want a word count of every word in this text. Um, functions have the power. I'm going to create some functions that I pass to other functions 
And I'm going to create these small bite-sized functions that will let me pipe them. You know, I can now include my function in a, in a chain of pipes so that I can pass this function around and, and clean up the data and, and make it smaller and more compact. And then the data doesn't change. And once I know the data doesn't change, that, that opens up the door for distributed computing. It opens up the door for multi-core processing. Uh, it opens up the door for really working with the data, knowing uh, that the data you have is going to be the data that it's not going to change. And so that really gives you the power to try and do some, some adventurous things uh, with your code. So again, at the end of the day, I feel like Elixir makes functional programming accessible to everyone. Um, like I said, over and over again, you're probably tired of me saying it. It made it so that even I could understand it. And, and I don't say that with like false humility or anything like that. I, I really believe that because it, it took me so long to get to this point to where I started to understand functional programming that now I'm able to have those conversations with the, the smarter guys at work that, that do really get functional programming and I can do it because of a list. Um, so the three takeaways, um, oh, that was for a conference, I'm sorry. There aren't takeaways. I mean, you can come try to hug me, but I'm in the United States, it's a little bit harder or hug the organizers rather. I love, I, I do love to having people talk to me. Um, so if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, my uh, my handle is down here at the bottom. Um, I, I I will I will talk to you guys there or email or whatever, and then you know go try out Elixir. So with that, my presentation's done. I'll open it up to any any kind of questions you guys have. Uh, does anybody have? Uh, thanks a lot, Nate. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Nate? Uh, okay, uh, Nate. Actually, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, so, uh, for me, when even even I just gave a, a presentation just before you, and even I was talking about learning Elixir, and I was also talking about learning Exorcism, learning it through Exorcism. Um, for me, uh, I just wanted to ask you: How do you end up learning those more challenging functional programming concepts better? What really helped you understand pattern matching better? What helped you to understand uh, recursion better? And uh, those particular functional programming concepts, which may not be very obvious upfront and can take people some more time to get a uh, grasp of, uh, what do you think people can do to understand those particular concepts better so they can get up and running with the language much faster? Yeah, um, so let me, let me sum it up to make sure I understood, right? So there's. We talked about some of the simpler things, but like pattern matching can get more complicated. It can lead to recursion. How, what, what's the approach to take to learn some of those things, right? Right. So interestingly enough, I actually cut out a section on recursion because I was trying to, um, this presentation, when I do it at a conference, is, is more, it can go into like an hour and 15 minutes. But um, I think when, when you say recursion, um, I, don't know about, I don't know about the folks in the audience, uh, it almost makes me have, break out in a cold sweat. Um, because if you've done recursion, and with an imperative language, I've never done it right. Um, I'll just say that. I've tried it before, and I always mess it up. Um, what helped me with Elixir, actually, pattern matching and recursion went hand in hand when I was learning that. So um, obviously, I started with the more simple pattern matching of like, let me just um, pattern match on like a case statement. OK, I've got that. Um, but the, there was an exorcism IO uh, exercise um, which needed recursion because it needed to um, uh, it needed to take a list and then start like working its way through that list. Yep. And to do that in Elixir without recursion would be really ugly and really hard. Right. Um, and so pattern matching there was one in which, okay, well now, let me go back here, let's go, actually, you know what, let's do this. Let me open that presentation um, while I'm talking about it. And that's not on the screen, is it? Mm -hmm. All right, so if we come here, yeah, I'll this. Say that again? Yeah, we're shooting the production. That was the that was exercise of IO. It was one of the exercises there. Okay. Um, but what it was is um, it was kind of this, right? So if we want to reverse a list. So if you have a string A, B, C, D, um, or a string one, two, three, what you want at the end is you want the, the opposite, right? You want three, two, one. Yeah. And so this is an example of pattern matching um, with functions and doing recursion. So the way Elixir works is it, it, uh, it takes the, it's gonna match first of all in the number of parameters, and then it's gonna match by the exact parameter. So here we have a, 
a list, we're going to pass in one, two, three. Here we have a, an empty list as the first parameter, and then the third option is a, a list. And so if we run through it really quick, um, if we pass in this list one, two, three, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to say, okay, well, I match, I match the one reverse list, the run reverse function that only takes one parameter. And so what that function does is it then calls um, this. It calls reverse one, two, three, and then an empty list. Well, that matches this function, um, where it has head and tail. And head is just going to be the first uh, item in the list, and tail is going to be everything else. And so it's OK, well, I know how to handle that. So it's, it's kind of coming back into that function pattern matching, excuse me, the, the pattern matching of function parameters that we talked about with like is dynamic. And, and it's just going to keep calling this function as we walk through it until it gets all the way down to here. And now what it says is, well, now I have a reverse with an empty list and a list. And that doesn't match the first one because it has multiple parameters. But it does match this one because the empty list matches here. And so that, that was the beginning for me of recursion. And, and I, I mean, I did all of this here in, in what, a minute? This probably took me about a day of playing with, or maybe even longer, um, but playing with, um, trying to figure it out, and, and just like trying things and failing, trying things and failing, um, and getting, you know, I get, I get part of the way there, and, and then something would mess up. Um, and so it was really just, you know, for me, it was a lot of trial and error, um, was how I picked up recursion. But, but once I got it, and, and there's some, um, uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but there was uh, someone on the Elixir team that wrote a blog about um, how Elixir handles the list functions like map and reverse and that kind of stuff. And it was very simple. It was, um, I mean, he used, he used simple language uh, to make it so that you know, people like me could understand. And once I read that and, and did some exercises, then I started understanding it. And really, once I got the idea of recursion, it was one of those kind of things that was like a, it snapped. You're like, oh, now I can see how this would work in lots of areas. Um, and so I guess my recommendation would be to, to pick a problem, maybe like reversing a, a list, and work on that until you can understand how the recursion's working. And then once you get that, you'll start seeing recursion. You'll start seeing the power of recursion where you can use it other places. Sure. Yeah, that's not the same. Yeah, absolutely. Hang on. Okay. Hello, Matthias here. Um, so Great. now that you uh, understood lots of stuff by using Elixir, do you feel more confident about trying Haskell again, for example? Do you think that you learn something from Elixir for like other things, or like for example, if you go back to Ruby or something? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so, um, uh, as I said at the beginning of the, the, beginning of the talk, I've got lots of um, I've got nine Pluralsight courses. Only two are on Elixir. Um, so, one of my more recent ones was a functional JavaScript talk or a functional JavaScript course, um, and it was the real basic stuff like map and reduce. And so, what I'm my next one um, that I'm working on is a more advanced functional programming concepts for JavaScript developers. And what I'm finding, I'm doing a lot of research right now, and what I'm finding is I'm, I'm, I'm winding back up with the Haskell documentation, uh, funnily enough, because that's kind of the, one of the sources of truth for functional programming on the internet, I guess. Uh, and it does make more sense now. And now there's still fit plenty of things I have to go look up because uh, Haskell uses a lot of uh, category theory terms and mathematical terms, uh, but it does make more sense now. So uh, I have, you know, once once I learned the concepts with Elixir, um, and I was I was able to learn the concepts without being overwhelmed with the vocabulary. I think now I'm able to you know understand um, Haskell a little bit more. I never I, I wrote one API in Ruby. Actually, it was Sinatra, and I did it in a weekend. And that was about six years ago, and I haven't gone back to it since. So uh, it's I haven't gone back to Ruby, but I was never at Ruby really. But it it's definitely helped me in other areas. It's helped me even in my JavaScript um, writing better code. I think by understanding Elixir. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Do we have any questions for Nick? Yeah, uh, Nick, I have a question for you. Um, this is Anil Thakurar. Um, so we, a lot of people come to uh, Alexa and Lung for basically concurrency, right? So uh, we got Beam, which is well established, and uh, an implementation, uh, earliest implementation of actual uh, model. Um, but uh, there are alternatives, right? So the mainstream languages like uh, Scala and Java they have their own like uh, actor side inbuilt uh, in Scala, and we have Akka, which is an actor modeling for Java. Um, so when people in the mainstream already have support for actor model, um, where do you think that like 
at our lung could be used for, I mean, it still has some benefits, I guess, um, from a VM uh, point of view, but in terms of catching up in mainstream, what do you think um, should happen so that Elixir catches up in our, so? Uh, um, let me make sure I, I understood. So uh, we're talking about different languages, Scala and, and some of the stuff on the JVM and some of the other languages that perhaps are a little bit more mainstream. Um, so was the question how how do how do we handle like how do we get Elixir mainstream or, or what, I'm sorry I might have missed the actual question. Yeah, so we we I mean a lot of people come to Elixir for uh, concurrency reasons. They want to get uh, when, when they have a huge amount of concurrency, they're expecting a huge amount of concurrency, um, like internet-based applications. So they probably think about um, Elixir, one of the reasons, right? So Elixir and one. Uh, but uh, we have actual implementations in other mainstream languages, right? So right now, so people use Akka and you know. Uh, actors in Scala. So my question is, uh, where does uh, Arlang shine? I mean, where where do you think um, uh, does it shine that people choose? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Yeah, so Erlang Erlang is not the inventor of the actor model, right? And that's 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 clear from from what you're talking about with Scala. And I'm, I'm even in my um, non JavaScript days, I was a .NET developer, and there's some there's some actor stuff in .NET as well that you can implement. Um, yeah, so I think where Erlang really shines. Um, in a couple ways. One, to me, it's it's the time that they put in. Um, so Java's great. Um, the other languages are great. Erlang's been around since 1985 and been running in production since 1985. So there's some definite advantage there, right? Like there's, um, I, I have to imagine, I haven't done the research, but I have to imagine that there's very few bugs in Erlang um, and, and that there's some very well-tested patterns and practices. And that's not to say that there's not in Scala and some of these other languages. Um, but that's, you know, it's kind of like looking at wisdom, right? You go talk to your grandparents because they're wise um, and they've probably gone through, like they don't, they don't understand what Instagram is and Facebook, but they understand what it means to, to have genuine relationships. And so you listen to them about, you know, relational advice, that kind of stuff. That's, that's kind of where I look at Erling. The other thing too is Erling has, um, has amazing fault tolerance. Um, one of the design principles of Erling was um, to let it fail. Um, whereas, you know, Java, not so much anymore, but Java, you know, used to have to check every single exception. Um, .NET has exceptions that, you know, you can use if you want to. Um, but the, but that's just it. They're exceptional, right? And so um, when something fails in .NET or when something fails in Java or when something fails in JavaScript, it's abrupt, it's disruptive, um, it's painful. Um, in my case, anyway, I never accounted for it. I, I, every exception I account for is not the one that hits, it's the one that I didn't think about, all that kind of stuff, right? Well, with Erlang, what their, process, their mindset is, is well, we can spin up these processes that are super quick and super easy, and so if something fails, nine times out of 10 or 99 times out of 100, it's gonna be data, not code, right? Like, the code's probably fine. And so let's just restart the process, excuse me, let's restart the process and, and kick back off again and and we'll let that go and and so you will see something fail um and and pick back up in erlang and run before you even realized that it failed um and so i think that's a that's a, a selling point of erlang as well uh, in addition to the concurrency is that it can handle that that failing really well and and, and there's a, another demo that um, i don't have on me anymore but um elixir takes advantage of that um with their supervisors um, and supervisors are processes that supervise other processes. And so their whole goal is to watch this process. And if something fails, it instantly restarts it. And so to me, that's really cool um, because you might get a, a, a weird, you know, something happens on the computer and the process fails. Well, in my, in my world, in .NET and JavaScript land, I have to dig through all the logs and figure out why it failed and restart the process and make sure I'm even aware. Um, you know, usually what happens is a customer calls me and says, oh, this, this thing isn't working. With Elixir and Erlang, by the time I know that the thing failed, it's already restarted and processing requests again. And so I think that's another advantage over just having the actor model. Thank you, Nick. Um, does yeah, anyone absolutely. have any questions? Yeah. Cool. Uh, I guess that's about it. Um, thanks a lot, Nick, uh, yeah. for talking to us all the way from the US. I really appreciate that. Uh, can we have a round of applause? Yeah.
Thank well, thank you guys. It was, it was probably as much, uh, I enjoyed it as much as you guys, if not more, uh, being able to, to talk to you uh, this morning, my time, and, and tonight, your time. So um, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.